good day, welcome, and thank you for watching. Let me introduce myself. My name is Michelle Adams, and I am an RN clinical case manager for the Department of Emergency Medicine here at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. Presently, I am a SUNY uh, holder of uh, alumni. I'm 19, no, it's 2005. I'm an RN. I became a master's of social work. Presently, I'm a doctoral student for a PhD in healthcare administration. Mm -hmm. I will be your moderator for today. In honor of Social Work Month, our subject for discussion is for social to public service, lessons learned along the way. An opportunity to type in some questions in the chat box audience, this will be afforded to you. So feel free to do so prior or just before the ending of this segment. I now would like to present SUNY Downstate's very own social work leaders. Clivia Torres, LCSWR, a bilingual licensed clinical social worker, R in SUNY Downstate Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's disease. Previously, she worked at Edwin Gould Services for Children a preventative service offered to families through, go, through Child Welfare Administration, now known as ACS. Mm -hmm. Clivia was a social worker for Hostos Community College, CLIP program providing mental health services for newly arrived immigrants learning English. She has also worked helping to rehouse homeless families. Clivia has a master's degree in social work from Columbia University School of Social Work, followed by a career with New York City Department of Education as school social worker in the Bronx and Manhattan. Our next leader here at SUNY Downstate, Ms. Felicia Thompson, LMSW, MPA. She is the director of social work at SUNY Downstate. During her tenure at Downstate, she has worked in the University Application Processing Center, has helped victims and survivors of 911, and provided counsel and resources for case management, social work, Medicare, Medicaid, MLTC, CHA, and other counsel. Mm -hmm. Alicia is a contributing author of a published book, Disability Studies for Human Services, an Interdisciplinary and Intersectionality Approach. She's a graduate of Morris College and HBCU something <laughs> South Carolina. And she has a master's degree in public administration and a master's in social work. Our keynote panelist, former New York City Schools Chancellor <laughs> Dennis Walcott, now heard on Queens Public Library, joins us today for a special conversation where our guests discuss lessons learned and applied during their careers. Mr. Walcott has served in numerous roles, including a deputy mayor for the education and community development in the Bloomberg administration and as New York City's schools chancellor. Before joining the Bloomberg administration, Mr. Walcott was president and CEO of New York Urban League. Previously, he was the executive director of Harlem Dowling Westside Center Drawing upon his experience and expertise in education and social work, he enjoyed a fulfilling career with children and families. Mr. Walcott is a former kindergarten teacher. Mr. Walcott, now president and CEO of Queens Public Library, QPL, has continued his love of education working to provide a foundation of education and access for this population. Welcome, Mr. Walcott. And thank you. And I, I look forward to the day of calling you uh, Dr. Adams. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You couldn't hear me? Yes. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I think the sorry. others can. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. okay. They should say that. <laughs> well, Mr. Walcott, I have uh, two questions that I'd like to start out with to, uh, to ask you. And the first one is, how can a degree in social work be beneficial and organization in an organizational leadership? So a couple of things. I think one for me, are you having difficulty? Because I see you leaning in. Hearing me? We can hear you. 
Michelle, okay, can you? Now I can. Now I can. Now you can? Okay, now you can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no, I just wanted to make sure. So to me, a couple of things are important as far as social work and organizational management and what it brings. I think one, we social workers are one of the most empathetic group of individuals when it comes to assessing the issues and dynamics of organizations and individuals who make up great organizations and having that leadership background as well uh, from a social work degree allows you both to understand the macro level of management, but also the important part of the micromanagement right. level of uh, dealing with individuals and assessing where they are and developing the support systems for organizations. So to me, it was always important to get the social work degree. And then when I decided to go to Fordham for my mm -hmm. social work degree, um, I wanted a concentration in administration. So I worked very hard in looking for placements because I did a work study program Mm -hmm. And so instead of two years, I did a three-year program where I worked and then went to school. And I found a couple of initiatives that, to me, really fit into uh, the administrative track. And then I had a minor in community organizing. Mm -hmm. So those two together allowed me to take a look at the role of administration and management in dealing as a social worker, but also the community organizing aspect of that as well. Well, my second question for you, and I have plenty more, but we'll give the panel uh, a, a, a chance as well. But my second question for you is, why did you become a kindergarten teacher? As a Black man, it's almost unheard of in education. So why was this role important to you? So I have two masters. So my first master's was in education. Mm -hmm. And so education was always a key part of my life as well. And then after I graduated with my master's in education, I came back to Queens uh, and I was able to really look for a job that fit the need of education and also blending in social work at the same time. And so I was able to go to a brand new uh, program called Amistad uh, Child Care, which was in South Jamaica, Queens. Mm -hmm. And they hired me and I had a ball. But then I also felt somewhat restricted in the classroom and that back then I was single. So I quit my job and I went on unemployment. And then I started an alternative big brother program that I called the Frederick Douglass brother to brother program. Mm. And that was back in the early seventies. That was around 1975, 1976, really. And I- Medical alert, stroke response team to the ER. Medical alert, stroke response team to the ER. Medical alert, stroke response came to the ER. And so with the um, desire of really creating my own alternative Big Brother program, because I had approached the Frederick Douglass uh, program, which was the name I gave it, and I approached the traditional Big Brothers program, whether they were interested in opening up a program in Jamaica. They were not because the city was going through its fiscal. So then I focused my program on for boys between the age of 5 through 12. And I did that. And then unemployment was good when you're single, but then I met the woman who would become my wife. Oh. You can't be unemployed and um, <laughs> no. getting married. <laughs> so I decided to go back to work, but then I was approached by someone about applying to be a social worker. But first I had to go through this work study program yeah. and it was at Fordham. And so my first placement, and I have to really ask the question, uh, around Edwin Gould, because my first placement as a social worker was at Spence Chapin Services to Families and Children. And at that particular point in time, Spence Chapin was lo located at 6 East 94th Street. And Edwin Gould at that time had a brownstone next to uh, Spence Chapin on 94th Street as well. So that really provided the opportunity for me to get the on the job experience as a foster care worker, an adoption worker, preventive service worker. And then my second year placement was at the great, what was called then the Greater New York Fund United Way. And that's when I started getting more of the administration management type of experience. And so every job I've had has been in public service with always an integration of either social work and education. Wow, that's really informative. Thank you very much. We're going to move on now to uh, Miss Felicia Thompson. Ah. So, Miss Thompson, 
What motivated you to pursue a career focused on your target population? Well, if you know me, you know I'm a lover of all. I'm a lover of all populations, but my heart, my heart of hearts <laughs> is with older adults. Mm -hmm. uh, like Mich Michelle didn't mention it, but I was raised in South Carolina. I was raised by my grandfather and I was always surrounded by older adults. My Aunt Margaret, who lived across the street, my Uncle James, who is my Aunt Margaret and my granddaddy's brother, lived in the back of us and all of their friends that was who I grew up with. Thank so you. I was surrounded with older people my entire life. With that, that, I mean, you know, oh, I want to say this too. The person in my life that came after God was my granddaddy, the one that raised me. But growing up with older adults, it helped me so much with my assessment skills, things I wouldn't have normally known or questions I wouldn't normally know to ask if it wasn't for them being around them. Like, for example, birthday, the birthday that they celebrate. That may not be the real birthday. Mm -hmm. For us, we had to go through my Aunt Margaret Bible to find out the real birthday of individuals. Words used may not have the same meaning, like pocketbook. So if they talking in their codes and talking about a pocketbook, that's usually someone has been raped, violated. It's Oh, yes, yes, pocketbook. Wow. Mm -hmm. You learn to listen because, you know, back then kids were seen and not heard. So you listen well. You And they always gossip and talking. So you listen, you hear, you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. The person they identify as their husband or wife may not be the real husband or wife. They could be married previously, never divorced, have a husband or wife in another state, but they live with someone else, common law, um, common law, husband and wife, and that's who they identify. But when paperwork is needed to be completed, you have to have the official husband or wife. Wow. The family member that an that uh, older adult or um, even they don't have to be an older adult, the family member that they take care of that no one talks about, <laughs> they say that person is senile. That person could be diagnosed or undiagnosed with dementia. So you learn to listen and <laughs> and and hear everything they have to say in order to um, make an assessment. So I thank them and I thank everyone before me that taught me um, to do assessments. Thank you so much. I, I think I'm going to uh, look at uh, that's what I say because you know pocketbook. Now I've just learned a whole new meaning about. Mm -hmm. book. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have another question for you. Um, so what are your biggest strengths in the role of uh, a social worker? What, what are your biggest strengths? Okay. For me, I love to see progress and improvement. I'm big on uplifting and supporting everybody, anyone around me, anyone I know. So if I meet someone at, at one of their lowest points and work with them and assist them to improve, whether it's health, finance, communication building, any improvements in their life that give them strength. I love helping and uplifting people. That is a big accomplishment for me. Thank you so much, Ms. Thompson. I'm going to move on to uh, Ms. Torres. Yes. So Ms. Torres, why did you pursue social work as a career? Actually, that's a really good question. Um, I actually grew up in East Harlem and I remember being a child, especially like in junior high school. And during the summer months, a lot of my mother's friends or neighbors that did not speak English, they would ask my mom for permission for me to accompany them on their medical appointments or to like social service agencies for benefits so I can translate. Okay, so for me, that was like the introduction of that. Mm. My mom also worked in the Department of Education as a secretary. So during the time that I had off from school, I would go to her job and just see how reward, how rewarding she felt when she was working with the principal, parents, and the children in the school. And I also ran a girls group in my house when I was rather young, like in junior high school. Mm -hmm. I was in gifted classes. So I remember we would come to my house, my mom's apartment, and we would meet there and just talk about different things that were affecting us as adolescents. So, and throughout my whole career, you know, I remember being in high and college rather, and my brother worked with senior citizens and older adults. And, you know, that was his passion. Okay. And so I sort of learned through my family, the values and the, you know, morals and the, you know, things to look at. And I decided that I wanted to become a social worker because I felt it was important to give back to the community. It was important to help empower people. And it was also important to just be a good listener when you're working with people mm -hmm. this is so true um i personally i have a close relationship with the social workers here at suny downstate and um 
Uh, they're great listeners. And they've taught me, uh, you know, they've taught me how to listen, you know, instead Absolutely. of being as a little impatient, you mm -hmm. know, and just listen first. Mm -hmm. I have another question for you. <clears throat> Does your social work training inform your work as a leader? How Absolutely. has it done so? Actually, it does because, um, as I mentioned in earlier, I'm a, one of the social workers. It's two of us, okay? It's my colleague, Yitin Chen, and mm -hmm. it's also me. So what happens is we work with a lot of medical students. We work with the psychiatrist, and we work with a geriatrician. And I basically bring, I guess, some kind of humility to the team. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I remind them that it's not all just a medical component. You know, we have to be sensitive when we're working with patients. We have to understand their needs, especially for those patients that do not speak the language. You know, mm -hmm. if it's a Spanish-speaking family, I'm the one that serves as a translator, and I can engage them in conversation and, you know, things like that. So I do think that my role in the department of, I mean, the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease is very important, and I appreciate Appreciate the fact that the staff appreciates my leadership skills. This is that's true. I'm um, believe it or not, um, with my experience, everyone appreciates the social worker. That's the first person they mm -hmm. they they call or look yes. upon. I, I work very closely with uh, social work, and I even sit right next to one. In, you know, in my daily activities. And the first, they don't want to speak to me. The first thing that they want to see or the person they want to speak to or is the social worker. So exactly. um, I can appreciate that. I'm going to move back on to um, Mr. Walcott. Um, how did you become involved in New York City government? And where does social work fall into that? Yeah, it's really a fantastic question because now you got me thinking hard. <laughs> and... I, you know, I've been blessed. I've been really blessed as far as the opportunities to work in different areas, the type of jobs. And part of, I guess, the answer to your question is that there have been always seen and unseen mentors in my life. And mm -hmm. so the seen and the unseen provided that guiding hand in and out of government because my first contact, I think, officially with government was when I was more so working with Harlem Dowling Children's Service. Oh, wow. We had to deal. So when I worked at Harlem Dowling, that was during the critical period of time when border babies were in the hospitals and crack had started, AIDS had started, uh, the homelessness. And back then, I mean, people forget that there were roughly 48,000, 50,000 children in forced to care. Mm -hmm. and couldn't find enough homes for the children who were there. Mm -hmm. And that required, especially as executive director, uh, for me to interface with government on a constant basis because at Harlem Dowling, we were located on 125th Street and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. I mean, we were really in the heart of what was taking place in society and then the violence that was going on. So there was that indirect contact with government in representing the agency. But then the unseen hands that some might know who were unseen hands and those who I'll never know, you know, they gradually got me involved in different mm -hmm. type of commissions or advisory boards with government. And there was a group of individuals who were black agency executives who I guess always watched out for the younger crew who were coming up and they would That's put that hand out there to, get you involved in this thing or that thing. So there was that formal and informal interaction with government. And then as I got more into not just Harlem Dowling, but when I left Harlem Dowling and went to the New York Urban League and the New York Urban League was a citywide organization, that role formalized even more so because uh, Mayor Dinkins asked me to join the old New York City Board of Education as one of the seven board members. Mm -hmm. And then so I was one of them. And then I was on the HRA advisory board oh. and so you know, they just started to push me in different directions while I still worked back then for the Urban League or Harlem Dowling and so it's the seen and the unseen hands that helped guide me and it was always part of my interest in DNA to be in public service and so I was really focused on how do I give back how do I satisfy the need for serving the community, but at the same time, um, being satisfied with myself. And I always tell this story, and this is a true story, that when I graduated with my MSW, 
I had several job offers and one job in particular paid me more, offered me more money for fewer days work per week. Wow. And <laughs> yeah, I know. And then <laughs> another job offered me less money for more days per work per week. And I took the job that offered the few amount of dollars because um, that gave me, as I viewed it, more opportunity both to grow as an individual and to serve the public in a way than the other one. And to me, that's always been a priority. So it's been those seen and unseen hands, uh, along with just being blessed, uh, that's got me into government in both direct and indirect ways. Wow, I applaud your, mm -hmm. your wanting to, to learn and to be invested in your, in your field. Um, not too often do we find that uh, mm -hmm. these days. Uh, we find a lot of people wanting to uh, get the degree and do and get and quick money do, you know, and you share and show us something different. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I mean, part of it is, uh, you know, I always think back because when I was in high school, I wanted to be a psychiatrist, but then I learned that you have to go to medical school, you have to be good in sciences. So that eliminated that. From me. I hear you. <laughs> I, know, I know my strengths and weaknesses and that definitely eliminated that part of the discussion. So then when I went to college, I started out as a psychology major. Then I got took uh, psychological statistics and that kicked my butt. So then I changed to sociology and then I, graduated with my sociology degree. And then, like I said, I went to uh, education for a master's. And so there was always the, the, the current of social work and education in one aspect or one definition or another that was always a part of my life. And I draw a direct correlation to my mom who worked for HRA uh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so I think her taking me to the various spots and seeing what she did provided some of that foundation for me to take that step into formalizing social work as part of my life. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's really, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see how you put it all together. Mm -hmm. You knew that the, um, you know, the sciences and the, that, that puts you off a little bit and maybe the math too. And then yet, and still you put it all together eventually and found where your niche was. And that's something that could, a book could be written just about that, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. Moving on. Uh, so how was your work um, at QPL or Queens Public Library expanded uh, libraries, pivotal role for marginalized communities? <clears throat> Has your work at QPL expanded the libraries, communities? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not, and I say this in all sincerity, it's not about me, it's about the team that I have as part of us. And so, for, for example, we had a meeting yesterday uh, with a gentleman who is the deputy police commissioner of collaborative community services, talking about uh, libraries and other not-for-profits and expanding their role in the community. And so I had our team on along with me and him uh, discussing that. And then one of our librarians who's in charge of our community services started talking about programs I didn't even know that we had, which is great. I mean, a program called uh, See You on the Other Side when people leave Rikers and the role that the library oh. plays in transitioning them out of Rikers into the community itself. Uh, we have a program that deals with uh, providing uh, folks who are moving out of Rikers with uh, uh, telephone, uh, iPhone service and all that to get them connected to the community. And so we do a lot of creative community outreach. And I always like to talk about how our library and a lot of libraries, not just ours, uh, our libraries, not just within the walls, but outside the walls. So we have mobile libraries that go to the communities. We have a old, um, what used to be the old good humor bikes. I don't know if any of you remember the way they were the good humor hey, bike. <laughs> they would have the, so we have a library uh, bike mobile where uh, the library, uh, bike is like that. And we have books in the front of the cart and the uh, uh, the bicycles able to uh, use uh, the computer to have people sign up for library cards. So we find different ways to get out into the community. And part of that is not just me from a social work background, but it's the team that we have in place that really identify, I think, the role the library plays in the communities of Queens 
and especially with the new immigrant groups that are coming in as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I just wanted to ask your team, does it incorporate social workers? Do you utilize social workers uh, to, as a part of your team or uh, do you use um, persons who want to be like interns and who want to be social workers or uh, anything of that sort to, to learn, um, you know, the, the in-depth thought processes of um, how social workers manage? So, yes to your question that some of the team members are social workers. Okay. A number of them are librarians, uh, and a number of them are community service workers. So not formalized social workers per se, um, but they all have, I think, the sensitivity of what the values of social workers are about. And they have the empathy, the assessment skills, and understanding of uh, how the needs are in the community and the role that we play both inside libraries and outside of libraries in interfacing with our customer base and the communities of uh, people in need. And so, yes, there's a mix of individuals, but I mean, when you think about it, librarians are really sensitive individuals who have to have that empathetic uh, understanding and assessing. And part of what we're exploring now is how we ramp up mental health services uh, because oh. we're finding, uh, and it's unfortunately and sadly not surprising, a lot of emotionally disturbed people who seek resource uh, in the library or just come into the library itself. And so what is our role in addressing the EDPs who come in and getting them to the appropriate support services as well? So we're exploring that. So I talked to someone yesterday about had a meeting with um, uh, an elected official about that yesterday. So yeah, we're always trying to redefine uh, our role in the community and maintaining our core services, but expanding those services to be even more community oriented. Thank you. Thank you for that mm -hmm. comprehensive answer. Yeah. I'm gonna move on to Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson, if you could give us new social worker tip to help them succeed here. Um, mm -hmm. What would it be and why? I would say um, to listen because you can learn from others before you. Remain humble. Humbleness will take you far. Apologize and learn from mistakes that you will make along the way. Take about accountability when you do make those mistakes. Yeah. Smile and laugh more because it will make you feel good and brighten someone else's day. Well, that sounds like you, Miss Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know her, and I can smoke that right away. I can see that and hear that right away. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's so true. Um, so, one more question for you: um, Does your social work training um, does it inform what you do, or has it done so? Okay, yeah, you, you know what? Yes, I, I I'm blessed that I had great mentors along the way, great leaders before me. I have great leaders now. I'd like to give a shout out to Susan Fraser McClary and Dr. Patricia Winston. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so I have great leaders. So, but my motto is school can teach you, but so much. Social work That's has true. to come from within. You have to want to help others, have compassion and empathy for individuals, and I lead by example. I can honestly say that we have a strong team, and I, I don't just mean my social work, I mean the whole care management team. So that's our case managers who's led by Carol Johnson. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> but I have an excellent social work team and i always yes, say do. that on the outside I tell everybody how good um, my social workers are i in my mind and, I, and i'm just gonna put it out there i think they're the best of the best and that's you too cleavage because you here too baby you here you you. <laughs> <laughs> but we are the best of the best we have some of the smartest social workers that go over and beyond for each patient that walk through that door. They honestly, um, they work together as a team. We collaborate, we uplift each other. They wanna be here. They wanna do good. And it's that fun. makes my job easier. It makes it's it fun. easy for me to lead them because they are so amazing. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much for all those shout outs. <laughs> uh, I know some of the people are going, oh my goodness. But anyway, thank you again, Felicia, yes, for that. Yes, this time yeah. for those um, shout outs and, mm -hmm. and your answer. Um, um, Ms. Torres, yes. I have something for you. How is your pre How is your previous experience applicable to the role you presently have? Um, for many years, I worked as a school social worker, okay, and I worked with young children. I also did early intervention for many years while working with the Department of Ed, mm -hmm. and then I was a pre-K social worker mm -hmm. for several years. Then I did elementary and then junior high school, and in the college experience that I had, I was able to work with older adults and younger adults to provide, you know, um, mental health services, and now I'm working with older adults. So I think that, you know, my whole career has given me the opportunity to learn from each and every, you know, let's say facet of my life, acquire new skills to make me a really good social worker working now with older adults. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoy working with older adults. I think it's a passion that I have because I'm committed to that population. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of them really need the support and the services that we can offer in our clinic and that I offer to them. So for me, I think all my whole personal experience throughout my life and through, as a social worker has really given me the skills. And I like, and you know, I'm Dennis, I actually worked for Harlem Darling at one point. Oh, I used, really? Um, I used to work part-time there on weekends, you know? When? When? I was, when was that, if I may ask? Um, I can tell you it was when I graduated um, for, um, I grad, it was like in 96. Okay. I worked with Melba Butler. Melba Butler. And right. um, Karen Dixon. Yeah. Yep. So now the CEO. Right. Yeah. Right. Sure. So, you know, it's right. giving me an opportunity, I think, you know, my whole experience. And, you know, I just want to um, sort of piggyback with what Felicia said in terms of, you know, like for new social workers, I definitely think it's important to, and to have a great mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had great mentors throughout mm -hmm. my whole career mm -hmm. who actually encouraged me to become a social worker. Dennis, it's interesting. I wanted to become a teacher at one point. <laughs> I went to class the first day and I said, this is not for me. This is too scripted. I want autonomy. Yep. I want to be able to be me and just have my own style of working with people. So then I became a social worker. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you. What... um. Your career has been oriented towards public service. Uh, so what counsel would you share with those who are seeking to work in the public service? Uh, there's some persons who oftentimes they, they don't want to, um, they want to sit behind a desk and just sit behind the desk. <laughs> but, but the public service um, person, it, it takes a lot. And it, and it requires a lot. And what advice, since you've had such vast experiences, what advice would you give that person? I would have to say that you have to be committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. The pay is not always the greatest, okay? Mm -hmm. I know when I graduated from Columbia University, everyone was like, oh, now you can go out there in the private sector and make a lot of money. And I was like, it's not about the money for me. It's more about the personal satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give back to communities, okay? I wanted to give back and I wanted, and actually that's one of the reasons I became a therapist because I find, especially among the Latino community, we have a lack of therapists that understand. And in our culture, especially, we don't talk about mental illness because it's considered taboo. So mm -hmm. I felt that if I can at least help people understand that it's okay to seek help, that it's, you don't need to be embarrassed about it, you know. So my recommendation for anyone that's considering the public sector as a career, be committed to it, be tolerant of it, because sometimes you have to just, you know, make changes a little bit at a time. You cannot make changes or immediately because it is definitely, you know, a system that you have to be up against. However, I think it's a really wonderful career. For me, it has really been a good experience. Mm -hmm. Can I add one point to that? Sure, Absolutely. of course. So and I think in addition to everything that was said, I think we must have been twins at some point because <laughs> I mean, this is the same type of reaction I had around you know, being scripted and having the flexibility. But the one point I would add to that is to find that trusted little network to support you as well. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. in important. public service, you're gonna get knocked around, you're gonna say, oh, why is it worth it? And finding bureaucracies that try to inhibit, it, inhibit what you're trying to do. 
Mm-hmm. And that's just part of life. And having that little support network that you mm-hmm. really trust uh, to me is so helpful because even the person who has all the support systems, you still you go through challenges as far as uh, how do I navigate this or how do I navigate that or is this what? and having that support network, that trusted support network, mm-hmm. I think helps you go a long way in navigating uh, that public service field. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to add, um, I worked actually with the city in the 80s, and that's when the problem of homelessness started. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I remember that, you know, we had to go out into some of the hotels and negotiate, can we put homeless families mm-hmm. here? We had to speak with um, landlords, can you rehouse and house a family for X amount of time? So like you said, Dennis, it's actually very important to be committed, find yourself that group of people that think like you, and mm-hmm. you can all support each other. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. You know, um, I, what I've learned about social work is that it is, it encompasses not just the learning, but the um, being involved, being, I think I see being an effective a social worker, you have to gain that experience by being there, being in it, being in the mix, as mm-hmm. they say. And um, I'll tell you, I, I, didn't, I never had an experience you know, I'm an RN, I'm a nurse, yes, I'm a case manager, but I gained more respect for the role of a social worker after having me, met Felicia, and Miss Thompson, and her sharing um, what a case, a social work uh, or care management is about, and she, she shared the collaboration of uh, not just social work this side, case management this side, she brought it all together, and that's truly, um, um, a, 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 I'd say, a blessing. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to throw this out to everybody. So um, what accomplishments, uh, I, I guess I'll start out with um, Ms., uh, well, Mr. Walcott. So what's, what's, what in your past accomplishments, what are you most proud of and why? Oh, my. So I'll answer you directly and also indirectly. Okay. People think, from a challenge point of view, uh, being the chancellor was probably the most challenging job that I had, but that's not the case. Oh. And I think going to your question about the reward and satisfaction uh, was when I was at Harlem Dowling Children's Service uh, because there was a lot of tough stuff going on. I mean, it was just a horrible period of time as far as crack, homelessness, AIDS, uh, border babies, and the number of people who were killed and we were right in the throes. And so that to me was a challenging period, but it also provided the most rewarding period. And so for me, finding homes for children, even though I was the executive director, I still acted like I was on the line as a direct (laughs) service worker. Finding homes for children um, who were languishing in hospitals were to me, one of those challenging things. I will always remember when you talk about Melba Butler, who uh, succeeded me as the exec, uh, Melba at that time when I was there was director of preventive services. And there was a woman who would come up uh, to the agency at 2090, uh, Adam Clayton, and she just had a lot of emotional issues and challenges. And then one day she called me and said she was thinking of committing suicide. So it was like, during the winter, it was dark and Melba was still there. And I said, hey, Melba, come on with me. And then we went out, tracked the woman down uh, in her place and then talked her off her emotional ledge at that point in time. Yeah. And we were able to engage her in a way that was extremely constructive. And that to me was rewarding. And then uh, she was always so funny because uh, she would come up on the floor uh, and she would yell down the hallway, where Harlem Dowling was at that particular point in time. And you know, where's the boss? Where's the boss? I mean, and, and but that connection as an exec, but also still having the social work DNA allowed me to help move her along the continuum of getting the appropriate support services. But finding homes for children who were languishing, there was one boy um, who was in forced to care, uh, in group homes, I should say, for a long period of time. And he was without legs and he was 12 years old. 
and we were able to find a home for him, which he lived until he became an adult. And matter of fact, I saw his mom, it's been a while now, maybe nine months ago, and I was asking how he's doing, because he's probably in his mid-40s now. And, you know, those are the types of things that, to me, were the most rewarding as a social worker. Thank you so much. That that was a lot. That's definitely a rewarding experience just to hear about. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Torres, I'm going to pose that same question to you. Uh, what past accomplishments are you proudest of and, um, and why? So while working with the Department of Homeless Services, I found it extremely rewarding when we were able to house a family from a into a permanent housing. Okay, and we were able to provide services for them, you know, not only in the transition from leaving the shelter, but after they were in the permanent housing. But my actually the greatest satisfaction that I have is on saving lives during my years of working with the Department of Education. When children express suicide ideations and you were able to recognize it and you took them to the hospital or you provided the services and you knew that you saved a life. And it was quite difficult because there were many nights I was up late, you know, at the hospital with the child, with the family and things like that. But to me, that has been very rewarding, knowing that I saved many, many lives mm. throughout my um, years at the Department of Education. Oh, that's a blessing. And Ms. Thompson, the same question for you. You know, I would have to say. Um, COVID 2020. Being here, I was in a different role at that time, but being here and helping people at their lowest, and it, it was a time of a lot of death. And we all were here. We all was working together, no matter what department you was in, no matter what your title was, we were all together helping people at the lowest point, talking to families, doctors talking to families, we talking to families, leadership talking to families, organized, sitting together, um, trying to figure out, because, you know, at this time, the the law, everything was changing daily. Everything was changing. Change one day you do this, the next day yes. you do this. That <laughs> you do so this. true. Yes. yes, yes. But we <laughs> all came together to help individuals in a time of need. It was a lot of death. It was death on top of death on top of death on top of death. So I know I say that to say too, we all probably need a little therapy after that. Um, because <laughs> we have to deal with what we endure. Absolutely. Yes, we have to deal <laughs> with it. But I think that was one of my reward, most rewarding um, times. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Mr. Walcott, your career has been oriented towards public service, and so what counsel would you share with those who are seeking to work in public service? Oh, it's a great field. I mean, it really is a great field. You are providing a service to the public, and I think it was said earlier, it may not be financially, and I mm -hmm. shouldn't, I mean, because, you know, you have to balance out your needs, and the roles and responsibilities you play within your family and the community, but at the same time, public service gives you a reward sometimes that may, may not be uh, seen through quick. And so you have to balance those things out. But I think the ability and the sensitivity of knowing that you're helping either an individual, helping mm -hmm. a community, helping a city in whatever context you're defining it mm -hmm. is me the fantastic thing. And it's a career worth doing. Plus, I, I think, I've always liked to talk about the careers that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. And there's so many careers yeah. in public service that people really don't know about. Mm -hmm. And so searching out those different type of careers, because you think of public service and sometimes one gets locked into a traditional thought, oh, it's this, that, or this one other thing. When public service can be in so many ways, shapes, and forms of serving the public. So I think it's broadening your thought process and then... I, I, take the opportunity to experiment with public service as well. And by experimenting with public service, then you really find that niche that you talked about mm -hmm. that fits your interest. And not to be sidetracked as far as, okay, I'm locked here and I can't go anywhere else. I don't believe in that. I believe in trying different things and trying risky things as long mm -hmm. as it's in the frame of public service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where would you where would you suggest people who are hearing you uh, speak of public service? Where could they look? What should they do? How should they go about that? Where would they so, find these job yeah. positions? So, I I would say good old fashioned research. Quite frankly, I mean, I think one has to look in 
her or himself as far as what they want to do. And so you say, I want to do something and whatever that something is. And then, you know, do your research as far as Mm -hmm. putting that interest in and then seeing what that career option may be. Uh, And then because public service, you know, I use, say, police as an example. Mm -hmm. You know, people think of police as just police on the street, police, you know, riding around patrol cars. I mean, even using PD as a backdrop, there's so many opportunities, I'm assuming, in PD that can be in the realm of public service, in the realm of social worker, and bring it together. Just like the gentleman I met with yesterday, he's in charge of collaborative community services. So he's really doing public service. He's doing a great job because he's he's laser-like focused on folks who are transitioning out of Rikers and getting them back into the community and integrate. That's public service. So I think there are a lot of different ways of defining public service and it has to come from within as far as what your strength is or your area of interest is and then taking it to that next level and doing the research and what careers flow out of that oh thank you i have a question um for all panelists whoever wants to chime in and the question is from the community uh the internet community it says how did you shift your services and delivery of the services for your particular population served during the pandemic? Oh, you want to answer this? Okay, I can I can answer. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> COVID didn't affect one person; it affected all people. So, no matter if you was an older adult, young adult, um, white, black brown, green, it didn't matter. Everybody was affected by COVID. You could have been rich, poor, homeless, everyone was affected. So it was no shift. We had to help everybody, meet them where they was at, help the families, help the patients, help everybody. So it didn't matter um, what population you served because everyone was affected. I just wanna add that at the Center of Excellence for Alzheimer's Disease, actually, I remember the day that our supervisor told Dr. Michael Reinhardt, um, he basically told us we're shifting to remote. So mm-hmm. everyone on, as of Monday is going to be working remotely. And we had to learn like the telehealth system. We had to learn, you know, the how we were going to interact. But we actually did continue providing the evaluations. We provided the uh, services to the families and the caregivers, mm-hmm. especially the patients, because we were concerned, especially since we worked with older adults who were very vulnerable to the COVID um, virus, okay? So in our clinic, actually, the whole team worked together Mm -hmm. and we supported each other. Initially, we worked long hours because we were learning as we, you know, were dealing with this um, pandemic. However, I think once we were able to get like a full understanding, we made modifications, but our patient never suffered because we made sure that we kept their appointments virtually. If we couldn't see them virtually, and we actually called some of them. And my colleague and I did the social worker, we spent endless hours introducing people to telemedicine. Like, how do you get on? How do you log mm-hmm. on to the Doxy platform or mm-hmm. Zoom? You know, so we spent a lot of time and that was really rewarding that we were able to do that mm-hmm. during this pandemic. And then when things got a little better, then we were able to return to clinic, but we also mm-hmm. had to staggered patient care and mm-hmm. even the staff. You know, we all didn't come back in together at the same time. So, mm-hmm. you know, the leadership that we have at the clinic allowed mm-hmm. all of us to actually work effectively yeah. and you know make sure that we were all safe. Okay, yes. And Clivia is right. The clinics did have to um, shift to a lot of um, home visit. But for us in the hospital, there was no, we was here every day. We didn't work from, like our team, we didn't stay home. I mean, we didn't work from home. We didn't have that option. We was here every day serving the community every day in-house. Um, and then it was some home visit. It was more telephonic, telephonic visit. Yeah. But for the most part, and everybody, every department is different. But for okay. us, we were here. Yes. Yeah. With the library, what we did was we shifted to virtual in the beginning, Mm -hmm. but we also shifted the use of our buildings as well. So since we didn't have customers coming in in the beginning, (coughs) um, we had our buildings serve as vaccine sites and testing sites as well. And so our libraries were used in very creative ways to serve the public and to be open to the public to get tested or to get their shots. And we made sure that we publicized that. 
And then even what we're doing right now in our virtual discussion, um, you know, that's maintained for us and I guess the whole world right now, that yes. balance of both in-person. I mean, I was at the library earlier today. I was out in the streets running around uh, to different libraries and, you know, having that contact with everyone basically back, but also we built in the virtual flexibility of different type of programs we offer. Uh, but now we have more um, in-person programs and virtual, but we still have some context of virtual. So, I mean, those are the ways we did it. And then obviously the physical um, structure of the building changed with more plexiglass mm -hmm. shoes and mm -hmm. those type of supports. And then interestingly enough, see, I'm not a librarian, but um, you know, it was frowned upon before COVID for people to wear masks in libraries. It's just because it would be a quote turn off to the public that you're blocking your interaction before COVID. And then even when COVID first started to uh, unfortunately impact all of us, uh, there was still some resistance to uh, masks being worn. And then obviously people kicked into another level of sensitivity and awareness. But so that's maintained itself and that you have those individuals who now still wear masks. Uh, when I'm in the building, I wear a mask. I mean, I just do, but you know, I don't micromanage that in that folks have the flexibility, both customers as well as our team members to be maskless than they are. And so, you know, those are the types of balancing pieces that we put in place to deal with COVID, but also uh, have the services continue to, for the public. Thank you so much. Um, well, here at SUNY, we we all wear masks. We just don't have them on right now, but <laughs> um, we do, and we are required to wear them at this at this time. Um, perhaps later at a later date, that will change. I see that some facilities are changing that policy, but at this time, uh, we all wear masks. But um, um, uh, and we are not to take them off unless we've left the building. I think the students, I think they're afforded an opportunity they do not have to, right. providing they stay on the university side. Um, but um, on this side, the hospital, we wear masks. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's definitely, definitely nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong no. at all. You know, I think it's a choice. You know, even uh, when you go to um, church, I see church. some people wear them and some people don't. So that's that's a matter of choice. And you're right, Mr. Walcott. Um, I would like to throw out there for all of you and anyone who can chime in. Um, what do you think your biggest strengths are with um, as being a social worker and how has it helped you uh, as, with, with those strengths? How has those strengths um, improved your delivery on your present position? Um, I could start. I'm actually, I know for myself, I am a very good listener. I'm very empathetic. I'm, I've been, I'm easy to engage and people actually share probably sometimes too much with me. When I was <laughs> in the board of vet, a lot of kids share too many stories. So of course, based on the stories, I was forced to call ACS, you know, because if a child was in danger, it's not something you can ignore. You just mm -hmm. have to act on it and, you know, things like that. But I actually think the fact that I'm very open in the way I interact with people, you know, like I try to reassure patients or, you know, clients that I'm working with that I'm actually here to help them. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to judge them. And those are things that we learn in social work school, mm -hmm. because if we are going to judge who we're working with and who we're trying to service, it's not going to be a good relationship. So we have to have those skills and we learn those skills in social work schools. And I think that since, you know, before social work and my master's program, I had those skills even as a child. And I remember, you know, certain things in my life that people were like, wow, you know, you're so caring, you're so nurturing mm -hmm. and you're so understanding of others. So I think for me, those, you know, experiences and qualities of myself have allowed me to become a really good social worker. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Torres. Thank you're you welcome. so much. Miss yes. uh, uh, Thompson, your, your, your face is right there looking at me. Oh, <laughs> I agree with Clivia. And I think almost every social worker on this call probably have the same um, observation. It's like everyone, they feel comfortable coming to talk to us about any and everything. It could be a stranger on the street. You could be walking in the supermarket, even at the gas station. Everybody feel comfortable. Like you have a lot of people that feel comfortable just coming and talk to you about any and every situation. You find yourself helping people you don't even know. You give them your number. They're like, can you help with this? Or do you know anybody with this? Or you, how can I get help with that? 
I, and they don't even have to know your title. They don't have to know you're a social worker. It, I guess it's just like a warmness we give off or exactly. a presence we give off. Um, yeah. but, but people do come up to you for a door parent and talk to you about everything. So I'm a runner. I, I run. I enjoy running. <laughs> I run early in the morning when I say early wow. in the morning. I mean, I'm out at 4 35 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And I say that in the context of your question because when I'm running and I run in my neighborhood and all, and um, I make sure I say hello to every individual that I pass mm -hmm. by at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Whether they speak or not, it's another story. But I always will say good morning to folks. And then if I'm running and I see a woman uh, who is walking to the bus stop or at the bus stop, I'll make sure I go across the street because I don't want to run up at her on her at that hour and, yeah. and so I'll make sure I announce myself like a half a block away a quarter block mm -hmm. away so it's not like a sudden surprise that the hell right. is up on me and I think that's part of the, the social work DNA in that mm -hmm. I try to be respectful and empathetic and mm -hmm. then in a really weird and perverse way being a social worker allows me to check myself because mm -hmm. I mean we're not perfect and so in the job you, know, you have to sometimes be hard edged around yeah. certain decisions and how you, right. things. Mm -hmm. but then I'll check myself. So that social worker part of me kicks in, mm -hmm. or as I like to say, the mother side of my family, of my DNA kicks in mm -hmm. and checks me as far as the hard edge side that may come out in either the way I'm handling an issue or interfacing with the person. Because the one thing I've always tried to do is always be respectful. Even if we don't agree, it's always be respectful. Mm -hmm. I think that's connected also to the social work part of life. I have a last and final question for you, Mr. Walcott. Um, it's, uh, it's specifically for you. It says, are librarians among those who are mandated reporters? I don't think they're man. I, I I don't have an honest answer for you on that one, but I don't think they're mandated reporters. But we do have an internal system of if something should pop up, then they feed it into our security team. Our security team then feeds it into the appropriate authorities. So that's the chain that we have. But to my knowledge, and don't hold it as fact, I do not think they're mandated reporters. Damn good question. I need to check that when we get off. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hmm. Um, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for uh, participating in this uh, social work uh, month mm -hmm. um, discussion. And um, perhaps maybe one day soon we'll have another one on another subject matter. And um, I just wanted to give the opportunity. There are things that I may not have brought up something that you might want to say. I'm going to give you each a moment. Um, Mr. Walcott, since you're there, I see you before me. Uh, can you give us some parting words? I mean, I just want to say thank you. I think this has been a great opportunity to really hear about the importance of social workers, and it just reinforces my uh, value of what we do and what we've struggled with. I, real quickly, I tell my wife this story all the time, uh, how when I was going to Fordham, and coming home after a class at 10 o'clock at night and standing on the number seven platform <laughs> and dead of winter and having that wind cut through you, um, it's all been worth it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Miss Thompson, you're right before me now. <laughs> okay, good. I'd like to say happy social work month to each and every social worker on this call. Thank you all. I would like to say thank you to our beautiful, amazing moderator, Michelle Renee Adams. Yep. You know how Same much here. I love you. Social work loves you. Thank you. Thank you all on the panelists. Thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Ms. Torres, you didn't pop up on my on my screen, but <laughs> give us some last and parting words, please. So what I would like to say is actually thank you for validating the profession that we are all mm -hmm. in. Because sometimes social workers are not are overlooked and people mm -hmm. sometimes do not understand the importance of having social workers yes. in any profession, you know, especially in hospitals. Sometimes, you know, you can work in the EAP unit, you know, where you work with colleagues who are going mm -hmm. through certain issues mm -hmm. and do not want to, you know, discuss it with uh, side professionals, but they'd rather stay within the hospital. So, but I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity and actually validating all the work that we do. Yes. Thank you all so very much for your participation uh, today. And um, 
I am a, uh, a, a not a social worker, but uh, I like to think that I am. And um, I, I appreciate you all mm -hmm. uh, for the work that you do. Thank you again and have a wonderful and blessed day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Good luck on your doctorate. All right. Bye. -bye. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Bye.